Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome to what promises to be a, a very interesting, I hope occasionally lighthearted, uh, but often serious, uh, look at where we are today in the country uh, through the eyes of four senators and one former professor who is now a senator, uh, as you all know. Uh, and I just, I want to preface this by saying, echoing the comments from Dean Manning yesterday, I think this afternoon underscores the commitment that Harvard has long had to public service, uh, to the notion that the graduates of this school should be citizen lawyers, uh, that they, yes, of course, uh, they may well go on to legal careers, uh, but the hope has always been that they would also be the stewards, the good stewards of our public life. And I think that's nowhere more true than today. It is worth remembering that Harvard overall has been a training ground for nine American presidents, uh, and from this school alone have come 37 United States senators. And we have an outstanding group with us today, and perhaps those numbers of future president, uh, presidents from Harvard uh, will go up. After you hear this, you may have a better sense of what that part, those possibilities are, but there are some people here on this stage who are often mentioned uh, especially by their advocates, as strong contenders for the presidency one day. We'll have to see where that goes. But today, what we're going to do is we'll have a, a round of a couple of set up questions uh, for them, uh, and then we'll, we'll turn eventually to more substance and what's going on today, and then we'll turn this over to you for your questions and at about, uh, about 3 o'clock. All right, so let me ask you first. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I would be in a chair, but I've but I'm happy to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> we have musical chairs, and guess who lost? The, uh, <clears throat> first question to each of you. And why don't we go down? All right, we'll start. Uh, we'll start uh, with uh, Jack Reed. I'd like to hear more about your background growing up, and what brought you to the Harvard Law School, and what your expectations were when you came. And in the second round. Let's talk about your time at the law school and how it shaped you in your public life. But start off with the question of your, what struck me in reading your backgrounds was how all of you came from modest means uh, and have done so much with your lives. It's, it really, they're inspiring stories. Jack. Jack. Well, thank you, David. It's, it's a little bit unfair about making David stand up because he's as tall as me sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> Now that you gave me a chair, I'll disappear. Yeah. <laughs> I have no problem standing up. Uh, the, uh, as David said, I was fortunate enough to grow up in Cranston, Rhode Island, not too far from here. And my uh, dad was a school custodian, and my mom was a homemaker, and they did everything they could to give me opportunities. Uh, at 17, I joined the Army at West Point, and I spent 12 years in the Army. And so from a very young age, I wanted to commit myself to public service. To, I found it very uh, self-satisfying as well as a way to contribute. And I was lucky after I finished West Point, uh, I went right to the Kennedy School. And in those days, it was in the Litauer Center. So I was very familiar with the uh, landscape. And three, four, or five of my classmates were joint uh, uh, law school, Kennedy School students. So I would go over to the dorm and indulge with them, and I would go around. And, and so I got to uh, feel for it. So when I arrived at Harvard Law School, I had a sense of uh, you know, what I might anticipate. And I must say, one of the first uh, moments I remember, actually, is being uh, briefed by my BSA leader, who's in the third row, Karen Falkenstein Green. And, uh, and Karen gave this sense of, this is a terribly intimidating place, but don't be intimidated. Uh, because, you know, working together we can get through. And that was very reassuring. And then uh, I was uh, extremely fortunate, as we all were on this dais, to have the opportunity to be here. Uh, when I left, the sense of public service was still there. In fact, I, well, before coming here, I was, had this decision point. I was very happy being an Army officer, uh, but this was an opportunity to pursue public service 
in, in uh, other ways. And so when I was here, I was very conscious that someday I might, and I wanted to be engaged in public service. And as David pointed out, one of the great attributes of this uh, school is it's contributed much to our public life and should continue to do that. Senator, can you tell us a little bit more about your Army service after West Point you had, and, and after coming to the Kennedy School. You were in the 82nd Airborne. I was. I, I uh, came to the Kennedy School, and uh, I learned one of the great lessons, which I le relearned at Harvard Law School. I was not the smartest person in the room. <laughs> and that is one of the most important lessons we can all learn in life. And so I, but I learned a great deal at Kennedy School. Went down uh, to Airborne Rangers uh, and Infantry School. Then I was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. I commanded the paratrooper company. And our, fortunately, we were at a time of uh, relative peace and calm in the world. So my uh, duty was uh, mostly at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And then I went back to Fort Benning for infantry school again. And I went back up to West Point and taught. And then I, I, I left uh, the Army and came here. And you have, you've been very closely uh, attached to <laughs> West Point ever since your graduation. I, uh, yes, uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, institution and I have great fondness for it. Um, I sometimes get uh, kidded about that by my chairman, John McCain, who uh, did not have the opportunity to go to college. He went to Annapolis. But <laughs> <laughs> Tom, please don't tell him. Uh, but uh, no, uh, and one of the, it's not just the education. It was the values of our motto, duty, honor, country. And so I, I'd like to think that I'm still using and, and aspiring to meet those values. And also, I must say, I'm remarkably impressed with the, my classmates then and, and graduates uh, around the world. And also, uh, people like Tom Cotton, who uh, wore the uniform of the United States Army, served courageously in combat and represents those same values of duty in our own country. Yes, we're looking forward. Thank you. I, Thank because, you. Senator Cotton, you were in the 101st Airborne. Jack couldn't get up to the 101st. He had to stop at 82nd. <laughs> Let's go to Elizabeth Warren. Oh. Senator Warren. So uh, I was the only one here that didn't go to Harvard Law School. Um, I, uh, I grew up out in Oklahoma. Uh, family that uh, was one of those paycheck to paycheck families. Uh, uh, my daddy did a lot of things when I was growing up. He sold fencing, he sold paint, he sold uh, carpeting. Uh, he uh, ended up ultimately as a maintenance man. Um, I uh, uh, very much wanted to be a school teacher. Uh, that meant you had to go to college uh, to be able to do that. Uh, I started off on a scholarship. I ended up getting married at 19. Uh, and my chance to be a college graduate, first in my family, uh, was a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. So I am a proud graduate of the University of Houston. Uh, I uh, uh, started teaching, uh, uh, and uh, one baby later, uh, ended up making the decision to go to law school. Uh, but I headed off to law school, again, Public, uh, public school uh, to Rutgers, which was near where we were living at the time, uh, with a two-year-old in tow. And so for me, the biggest experience about law school, and I can still remember what the first day was like, uh, it was all about child care uh, and whether or not I could get somebody who would take care of this two-year-old in a place that I could be comfortable with. It was, um, I had everything lined up to go to law school. I mean, look, my mother thought I was crazy to do this. My brothers thought I was nuts. Uh, my then husband uh, thought that, uh, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Smiled indulgently, sure that I couldn't do it. Uh, but I ducked my head and decided I was going to go to law school. And uh, I got all the pieces together, but the hard part was childcare. And uh, every place I went, it was, you know, one place smelled funny, and one place the children all looked miserable, and it was just kind of one, it, I see a lot of people nodding their heads, it was one horrible experience after another, and it was getting down to, I was going to have to show up for classes, and my, my daughter, Amelia, was about to turn two, and was not going to be my partner in law school, and... Uh, <laughs> 
So uh, I finally found a place, and the only hitch was they only took dependably potty trained children. <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember filling out the form. It, we're like a week away from the beginning of classes. And I'm dependably, she's not two years old yet. And I'm like, check. <laughs> <laughs> How hard could it be? Uh, uh, I just want to say that my path to Harvard Law School was brought to you courtesy of a cooperative two-year-old and three bags of M&Ms. Uh, but that's what it took. I made it to law school, and truly, the first day in law school, what I kept thinking about is whether or not that dependably trained potty, dependably potty trained child was in fact so dependably potty trained uh, in that first day. Uh, but Law school, uh, I graduated from law school uh, uh, hugely pregnant uh, and utterly unemployable uh, in those days. And uh, practiced law in my living room for a little while. I uh, ended up going back into teaching, this time instead of uh, the four to six year olds that I had before. I had much taller students uh, in law school. And uh, so I taught uh, at Actually, we moved again. I taught at Houston. I taught at Texas. I taught at Michigan. I taught at Penn. And uh, by the time I came here, I already knew what I was doing. And that was, I was deep into the fight on what was going wrong for middle class families all across this country. How working families were just getting increasingly pounded in an economy that didn't work for them, and a government that, in my view, didn't work for them. So. Uh, I had written books on this, I engaged in a lot of research on this, articles spoken out a lot about it, and Harvard asked me if I would come and teach for a year as a visitor. And so that's when I first came to Harvard. Harvard made me a permanent offer, asked me to stay. I said no, and went back to Penn. Well, then I came back to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, you're being modest because it's it's <laughs> worth pointing out that she, uh, at, in the five universities where she's taught, in four of those universities, the students have nominated her for teaching awards at the end of the year, and two of them have come here at this uh, at the Sachs Freund Award that uh, Elizabeth Warren has won twice here at this this at this law school. So, well, over to Senator King, please. Well, talk about culture shock. So, man, I had <laughs> major culture shock coming here. I grew up in Kansas City. Uh, my dad was an iron worker and welder, had a little union organized iron working shop. And my mom would do the books and sometimes sell a little bit. And my two brothers and I worked in the shop for my dad. I went to Mizzou and I decided after I read the book Simple Justice by Richard Kluger that I wanted to be a lawyer. And so I applied to the University of Missouri and my faculty advisor says, you know, actually you have pretty good scores. I mean, would you want to go anywhere else? I'd never been out of the Midwest. He said, you ought to apply to Harvard. This is John Kuhlman, my advisor. I give him thanks even today. So I applied. I got in, had never been on campus, showed up. And these are about my first three memories of my first week. I get off the plane at Logan, and there's some guy who's working in the airport, clearly from like the north end. And he starts to say something to his friend. And I remember thinking, what language is that? <laughs> <laughs> what country am I in? My second day in law school, I'm walking through the tunnels here, and I walk by somebody and I say, hi, how are you doing? And he goes, you have the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> then, well, so it was, it was definitely a culture shock. It was definitely a culture shock. Um, but it was, uh, it was immediately a blast, too, because I, going through Mizzou, I really felt like I loved it, big campus, Somebody else I met my first week said, where'd you go to college? I said, University of Missouri. He said, that must have been fun. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but going through Mizzou, big campus, I had, I loved it, but I was like an independent student. I'd never had the same people in any classes. And the thing that was so different here was the camaraderie of a section of 135 people taking all your classes together virtually all year. And so that was an amazing experience after I got over the accent and, and not everybody will say hi to you if you say hi to them. Um, just the cool nature of my classmates. I had great teachers, too. I may talk about that later. But the big culture shock is the thing that I remember most about starting here. Yeah. 
You came from a, a deep Jesuit faith, <coughs> too. That shaped, shaped you heavily. Yes, so I, I was educated by Jesuits in high school. Uh, Jesuit high schools, if they're all boys schools, men for others, if they're co-ed, people for others, this is a motto. And I was very stamped by the Jesuits. And um, in the middle of my first year here, uh, I, I was 21 when I started. I'd gone through college in three years, and I realized, why am I rushing? All my classmates had, you know, done cool things, and I had just come right here, and I really knew nothing about the world, and I decided not only am I rushing, but I don't really know what I want to do with my life. We were talking in the break room. I knew Wall Street wasn't, that one for me, but I didn't really know what was for me. So I remember going into the dean's office in November. I'd been here for like two and a half months, and I said, I want to take next year off. And Molly, I'm blanking on Molly's last name, who was kind of like, not the dean of the school, but the dean of students, said, Molly Garrity? Mo yeah. Molly looks at me and says, you want to take your off? What do you want to do? I said, I want to go work with missionaries in Honduras. And she then, she pulls out the grade book to open to see, well, you're not flunking out, so that's not the reason. And she pulls out the bursar's book to see if I've paid my tuition. Okay, well, you're not, you're not behind on your payment plan. You really want to take a year off and go to Honduras? Yeah. You going to come back? I said, well, I think so. Um, well, there's no rule that says you can't. Okay, you can do it. So I took a year off, David, and went and worked with Jesuit missionaries in Honduras at the time, military dictatorship, swamped by refugees from civil wars in El Salvador and Guatemala. It was the staging ground for the U.S. Uh, border war against the Contras in Nicaragua. I was like, like a surfer dude that didn't know what I was doing, walking into the midst of an incredible cauldron with Jesuits who were definitely persona non grata with the government there because they were battling for the, the least of these. And that, that experience, uh, next to marriage and parenthood, that year was the pivotal year of my political life. And I was inspired to do it by Harvard students who had done cool things before they went to law school and convinced me maybe I should take some time to figure out what I wanted to do. Wow, great story. All right, so we'll come back to, to your experiences uh, Senator Warner, Mark Warner from Virginia now, uh, you, you also, but you're, you were the first in your family to, to go to college. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I, I grew up not unlike a lot of us up here. I'm middle class in a middle class family. Grew up in the Midwest in Connecticut. Not something, <laughs> not something, the Midwest and Connecticut. <laughs> not something I emphasized when I ran for governor or senator in Virginia. Um, and... You know, I'm, I'm 62. I always like to say I was old enough to be touched by the idealism of the 60s, but not old enough to be jaded by the 60s. Uh, somehow I had a, a little bit of a political bent. Uh, went to college at, uh, in Washington because I wanted to see if I could work on Capitol Hill as a college student. I uh, didn't think about going to law school, but you know, he talks about the uh, notions. I, you know, I actually was dating somebody at the college at that point, and she said, you ought to apply to law school. I thought, you know, putting off real life for three years, and she suggested Harvard. Never in a million years would have thought I could have gotten in or gone to Harvard. Um, lucky enough to get in. Uh, echoing what Jack said, it was literally, I'd, I'd done well at GW, at Valedictorian. It was the very first day of law school in Mort Horowitz's torts class yeah. that I realized, holy heck, these people are really freaking smart. <laughs> <laughs> so I immediately decided, no law review for me, but I was proud that I was one of the co-founders. I was the class of 1980 with an organization that existed for about five or six years that was, for at least my tenure at law school, was the single largest student organization at Harvard Law School called the Somerville Bar Review. <laughs> <laughs> went to a different bar in Somerville every Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there were even times when we invaded the... Uh, the library with uh, cases of beer and boom boxes that uh, managed to freak out some librarians. But you know, I had a great time at law school. I had made friends. <laughs> and, that's, and, and unlike everyone else, I decided to become a client rather than a lawyer. So that's why they've got ties on and I don't. Uh, uh, I went out and got out of law school and I'll come back to the experience, but got out of law school and decided to pursue politics. And went to work for the Democratic National Committee for $18,000 a year. Year and a half after that, decided I'd become an entrepreneur and went out and proceeded to fail not once but twice at business. Uh, and decided on a third try that I would try this brand new area called cell phones. 
and this is 1982, and went around to all of my Harvard Law School classmates who are all at the extraordinarily respectable firms that you guys are all at, and I said, there's this new thing coming called cell phones. You guys want to invest? And everybody said to me, Warner, you are so crazy. Get a real job. Who's going to want a car phone? <laughs> They're still billing in six-minute increments. <laughs> uh, and was lucky enough to do well, started Nextel, and, but in a lot of ways, the... Um, the kind of understanding and the connections and the ties. I'm, my closest friends in life are still my law school classmates. I, I still get together with a ton of them. Um, matter of fact, Tim and I met in uh, my third year, his first year. So, suffice to say, it was not at the library. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we've actually known each other for 38 years. Um, and uh, it's these kind of ties that, uh, that I think keep this place so special. And, I tell you, barely any of you look 200 years old. <laughs> Senator Tom Cotton, youngest member of the Senate, and one with the most... That's a very low bar to clear in the U.S. Senate. <laughs> 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 if it wasn't was for me, all four of them could also compete for that title. <laughs> Octogenarians that we have. <laughs> I think there's only two that were there when I was born, Pat Leahy and Orrin Hatch. So you have one of the most interesting stories coming out of Arkansas, farm in Arkansas, sixth generation Arkansan. <laughs> so uh, it's great to be back at Harvard Law School. I think I haven't been back for, uh, for six years now since I was up here for a 10th year anniversary uh, ceremony for the 9-11 attacks, uh, which I experienced here. Um, I, I came to Harvard first as an undergraduate. So I, I left Dardanelle High School where I'd grown up you know, in a small town, a small what, farm. What, you, what brought you to Harvard? Uh, I don't know, bad judgment? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what I thought after I got my first class and got my first midterm paper grade back. Um, you know, I had a chance to, uh, to go to school outside the state. I started uh, in my junior year getting some recruiting interest, uh, first for athletics, then for academics. So, you know, I probably thought I'd go to University of Arkansas where my sister was at the time and where my parents had met. Um, but uh, then I started getting pamphlets and started getting some academic interest as well. Um, you know, I aspired to play basketball here for the Crimson. Sent in my video, t you know, the VHS tape. I know a lot of y'all don't know what that is. My highlights and the uh, assistant coach there said we'd love to have you come and contribute to the program. So we have open tryouts. We don't have scholarships. Um, so I got there on day one of open tryouts and I realized that while they might not have scholarships, they definitely recruited. And I was not a recruited athlete. So I played one year on the junior varsity team uh, and then hung it up. I was a high school hero and a college zero in basketball. <laughs> Although I am proud to say that uh, in my first year of law school, the Harvard Law Stars featuring me underneath the basket won an intramural <laughs> basketball championship at Hemingway Gym. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, you know, after I got my feet underneath me in the classroom in college, I just, I really enjoyed Boston. I had a great experience here on campus with all of my classmates uh, and had a chance to take a year off after my final year in school. I really enjoyed working on a senior paper thought I might want to go into academics. I took a year off. I went to Claremont, California for a year. Some people take a year abroad going to Southern California, spending all those years in Boston. It's kind of like a year abroad. Uh, but ultimately, I decided that uh, you know, I wanted to come back, go into law. My sister was at law school then by University of Arkansas. I enjoyed what I heard about it from her and her friends. So I came back here. I, actually, I lived in Harvard Yard all three years. I was a, uh, what they call a proctor, uh, what a normal college calls a resident assistant in uh, Matthews, just down the street from and uh, things were great for me uh, going into my third year. I already had a uh, clerkship in hand. I know they didn't notice that that early these days. I uh, had two, two job offers from law firms in hand. I'd already written my third year paper in my second year for a seminar. So when I drove back to Was or from Washington, D.C., where I'd worked that summer, uh, to Harvard Law School uh, on probably Labor Day weekend, maybe the Saturday of Labor Day weekend in 2001, uh, things were just all turned up roses for me. Uh, I drove past the World Trade Center, uh, which just a few days later was knocked down on 9-11. I was in this building when that happened. I was taking an early morning class, probably 8 or 9.30 or something. This is back when Mastodon still roamed the earth. So we didn't have, we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have Wi-Fi in the classroom. So for probably an hour or so, 100 or so students sat in that classroom un unaware of what had happened. We walked out just to the corner of the building between Austin Hall and Langdale. There are 
dozens of students out there. They looked shell shocked. They were crying. Learned that something had happened at the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon. So walked over to Harkness uh, and spent the rest of the morning there. When I saw those buildings go down. Uh, came back. Came back that night to Lendale where we had a prayer service out on the steps. And from that point forward, you know, I didn't really want to be a lawyer anymore. Uh, nothing against law. I enjoyed practicing law to the extent I did. Uh, I did practice for a couple of years to pay off my loans. Some friends of mine who were in the Army at the time had discouraged me from doing what I wanted to do, which was rush out and join on September 12th. They said, you don't want to have three years of Harvard Law School loans and be making a lieutenant or a private salary. And right about that, a few years later, when I was clearing about $420 a month as a young specialist in the Army, uh, but uh, that desire to serve never really left. So after I paid off my loans, I, I left my law firm. Uh, I was a little surprised that all the lawyers at my law firm agreed that this was a good career move for me. <laughs> because I wasn't, mind you, I wasn't going into the Jack Corps. I went into the infantry, uh, and they all knew I was going to do that. Um, but uh, I joined. I served for five years on active duty and uh, did like Jack. Went to you know, Fort Benning, did all the basic courses there, infantry basic and ranger school and airborne school. And was, Overseas twice, uh, 101st uh, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, and then with a reconstruction team in Afghanistan. Uh, between those tours, I served at Arlington National Cemetery, with the Old Guard the unit that does all the funerals and guards the tomb and performs the ceremonies around Washington D.C. And uh, still the best experience uh, I've had in my life, the best job I've ever had. Right. Um, I'd say not necessarily most important job, as John Kelly has said recently about his job. Um, you know, the job he has now is the most important job. Is the most important job I've had, but not the best job I've had. The best job I've had was leading 40 infantry soldiers in Baghdad in the defense of our country, wearing our country, country's flag and uniform. Yeah, I'm, it's a compelling story. I, there's one piece of it how you were shaped by your readings. And you, and you, you wrote in your thesis that you had discovered, quote, political philosophy as a way of life. What, what did you mean by so that? So we're not going up in Dardanelle. Dardanelle Public School is very good. We didn't do a lot of primary reading of things like uh, Plato and Aristotle, and Federalist mm -hmm. Papers, and Tocqueville and the rest. Uh, so I had a lot of horizons open to me uh, once I discovered those great books of old. Um, and, you know, the, the, the first philosopher, uh, Socrates, said that wisdom is virtue uh, and that the pursuit of wisdom, which philosophy is, is really the pursuit of virtue. It's trying to improve your character and uh, improve yourself. That's kind of what something I've had open to me at school. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd had that growing up in church at home, but never really in, the, in that way in the pursuit of wisdom. And it's a really important lesson uh, for, for those young people here who haven't learned that. Um, I'd say, you know, you got you get a lot of career advice, uh, a lot of life advice. I'd say the most important thing you can focus on is your own character and your own experiences. Uh, people can take pretty much anything away from you in this world. They can take away your job, they can take away your reputation, they can take away your money away your family, they can even take away your life, but what they can't do is take away your experiences and take away your character. That's the thing that lasts eternally. Let's, let's, can we just pick up from here and move into the second round of questions and you, be the takeoff point here. You, so you had Elizabeth Warren as your teacher in contracts. So first first day, first class. First day, first class. <laughs> <laughs> I was, she was first with me. She was, she was probably a better teacher than I was a student, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but you, uh, a formative uh, experience for you, it, it is said, uh, was a, uh, a, re a class that met, or a study group that met once a week with Marianne Clendon, professor, uh, to, uh, to talk about, to read and talk about de Tocqueville's democracy in America. How did that shape you? Yeah, Marianne Clendon, obviously, was a fantastic professor, uh, a great professor of uh, of the law, but this was not a legal course. This was just a small study group in her office, in, uh, Hauser Hall, which was brand new at the time, um, about democracy in America, which I, I think is one of the great books about uh, our country, not just our system of government, but our, our ways, our, our mores, our customs, and the way we see the world, um, and both the great virtues of American democracy, but also the vices to which any democracy uh, can tend. Uh, and being able to sit in you know, a small group and read with Professor Glendon uh, once a week that entire uh, year, and also be able to read have, have a chance to read Democracy in America carefully from cover to cover um, was a really a long read. wonderful experience. It is a long read, but it's a good read as well. Uh, it's a pretty far-seeing read as well. It was published, I think, 
110 years, 105 years before the start of the Cold War, uh, and the final page of Book One of Democracy in America is Tocqueville saying that it seems by fate that uh, the United States and Russia are destined to hold half the world's uh, uh, futures in their hands. Uh, just uh, one example of how far-seeing Tocqueville is about American democracy and the role of American democracy in the world. I'm, I'm, I've been curious, and you are the. Yeah, I, I, I love the fact that you, as a Republican, have come here. I mean, you've got you know you're outnumbered. Here on this, but I know this is not really a fair fight here. Yeah, well, you're holding. You need up. you need at least three more Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Well done. Well done. You can see what a shy, unassuming fellow is. Tom is. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just curious. I will say the breakdown in the Senate is pretty even. I think there's four Democrats who graduated from Harvard Law. There's three of them here, and then there's Chuck Schumer. And then on our side, uh, in addition to me, we have Mike Crapo, the chair of our banking committee, uh, and Ted Cruz. Um, I don't think Ted couldn't be here today because he's going through the newly released JFK papers trying to learn the truth. About <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, you came well prepared. Okay. What I want to know is Tom Cotton says what we all think. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so. As a conservative, as a young conservative, evolving conservative, how did you find, did, 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 was it awkward for you here at the law school? Was it something, did you find it challenging because you had people who were, didn't agree with you? Did you grow a lot as a result of that? I'm just curious. No, I, mean, I think that's a special part of, of, of Harvard, not just the law school, but the college as well, um, is that while well, I always felt you know, that I was in the minority of right. political opinion to the extent I was expressed Republican and conservative opinions, I never felt like it was a beleaguered or oppressed uh, minority or minority that might <laughs> face repercussions for expressing unpopular opinions. Um, and I was speaking to some students, some students yesterday about this, and, and they said the same thing. And I think that's pretty good uh, and reflects well on Harvard because that's not the case in some campuses around the country. Um, part of that is that Harvard law school size, you know, it's one of the largest schools in the country, so even if you have a small percentage of Republicans, you still have a critical mass of them. Um, but also I just think it's, it shows Harvard's commitment to learning, and part of learning is being exposed to new ideas, and sometimes those ideas are uncomfortable, whether they're your ideas of your peers or ideas that you discover from great thinkers who have written books from different times and different cultures with different uh, ways of thinking. Um, but I, I never felt at Harvard uh, like I couldn't do, I could do anything other than express my opinion fully and frankly, and that's true whether it was in the classroom um, or just in private conversation uh, with my friends and classmates. Yes, sir. Mark, how did you? Uh, you're, you're, how did you? When you weren't in Somerville at the bar, uh, how did the rest of your time here at the at the law school shape you in terms of your public service? I think it it exposed me to people of. Incredible diversity in terms of thought, uh, echoing uh, what Thomas said. Um, you know, I fairly quickly realized that the idea of you know, the traditional idea of being a lawyer was not going to be in my future. So it gave me a maybe a freedom to try different things. I did some. Uh, I TA'd a, a class for John Rawls, that frankly was uh, who was at the college at that point, and um, was probably one of my most meaningful academic experiences, even though it was at the college rather than at law school. And uh, I, I think there, I have memories of some brilliant teachers, but a lot of more of my memories were interactions with classmates you know, who, who came from all different varied backgrounds, everybody whip smart, uh, and it, it pressed you on, on no matter what your position was, there was always somebody who was willing to take a counter position, if, if just for the fun of it. Um, and that, I think that that helped. I was also uh, said coming in in the late se or late seventies, I felt like I was in with a group of folks that still felt that they were touched by the idealism of the sixties, and I saw a lot of folks as they kind of transitioned to where everybody was going to come in and save the world. And by the end, most folks decided to work on Wall Street, and I think that you know, was a concern. I, 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 it was something that. Um, I think the law school still has to struggle with a little bit to try to get people off that just accepted 
easiest default path. And I give Tom credit because a lot of folks, they say they're going to go do this. You know, I'm just going to practice for a year or two. And they get caught with those golden handcuffs. Um, so in a certain sense, since I thought I might, you know, be, I was interested in public policy, I might try something. I didn't think law school was necessarily going to define me. So it fine, but it wasn't like be all end all to be, to, to not be, you know, for example, law review. Um, I think last point I'll make so we make sure we get everything time is uh, law school also because of being exposed to so many smart people reinforced the notion you got to be it's got to be okay to fail. One of the things about law school I think that they read out of you here is you, know, you got to be success and don't take risks. Uh, you know, everything I've ever done in life um, I failed at first. Yeah, I failed politics first. I failed at business. You know, uh, and I think that. Um, too many people in our society are risk adverse at this point, echoing some of the concerns that Elizabeth had. Too many people live in way too much economic insecurity at this point. And if we don't figure a way to wrestle with some of these policy issues, uh, more and more people are giving up that the system is going to reward them. They turn to the extremes, and that's not the the America that I think that the Cokeville wants, or frankly that all of us want. We may want to get there in different ways. Um, but, but that notion that risk taking, that failure is okay, that you can risk rebound from that, that is quintessentially American. I think that is somewhat seeping out of our system too often now. Does that include running for president once and then maybe trying it again? <laughs> it, it included kicking the tires one serious time and getting to the point where I always remember I, I'd said to my wife and then three teenage daughters, and they were just finishing up being you know, governor's term, and they were pretty sure, but my daughters at least, that, um, uh, that I might have a good shot. And we sit down at this family dinner to have the decision after a year of kicking the tires. And halfway through the first uh, the restaurant, first course, two of the daughters were crying in the bathroom. And you know there was an absolutely four to nothing vote. And I said, that went over pretty well. So <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think about uh, three things that happened here at law school that really shaped my career. One, I met my wife of 33 years. It was worth 100 years of Harvard tuition. <laughs> my, my, my wife, Ann. My wife, Ann, great public servant. Legal aid lawyer, juvenile court judge, first lady of Virginia, reformed the state's foster care system, secretary of education, now on our state board of education, the best public servant in my house. So that was the best. But you, you met her when you came back from Honduras. When she yeah. wanted you to go back, get back into prison reform. That's right. So I, I started a year ahead of my wife, took a year off, came back. So that was another virtue of my Honduras, because now we were in the same class. And she recruited me to rejoin PLAP, which I had worked, Prison Legal Assistance Project, worked in my first year. So that's the best thing. But I'll tell you two lessons from my time at Harvard. One was a career lesson, one was a life lesson, moral lesson. So the career lesson was I had a lot of classes from like super brainy theoreticians, but I was a nuts and bolts civil rights trial lawyer in the South for 17 years. And I tried cases from traffic court and appeals in the U.S. Supreme Court and everything in between. And I won big ones. I won the biggest civil rights jury verdict in the history of the United States in 1998 at that time. And I lost big ones. I walked a client into the death chamber in Virginia and held his hand when he was strapped down to be executed. What I remember about Harvard is how incredibly practical what it was that I learned here. You know, I was learning from brainy people who most people thought were not practical at all, but it just, I came here maybe as a young 21-year-old thinking law was something to be understood, and I left here thinking law was something to be used. What about understanding it? It was about using it. And that just helped me so much um, in my 17 years of trying cases. Then even afterwards, Jerry Frug, who taught global government law here, had a wonderful law review article, The City as a Legal Concept, that was really brainy, but when I was city councilman and mayor, that super theoretical stuff really helped me do some practical things I wanted to do. So when I think of Harvard, I think, what a great trade school. You guys gave me some like really practical things that I was able to turn into this cool civil rights and then public service career. The moral lesson is a little more challenging. So I was 21 and I hadn't seen very much of life. And he, this was the first time in my life I was surrounded by Everybody was super articulate and super opinionated. And I never understood the difference between an opinion and a conviction 
until I came to Harvard Law School. And over the course of my three years at Harvard Law School, interrupted by my time in Honduras with people who are deep people of conviction, I came to really see the difference between opinions and convictions. You, know, you could be a great champion of social justice but not treat other people very well. You could be a great anti-poverty advocate <coughs> and love creature comforts. You could be a moral person, deeply moral and judgmental person but tolerate a whole lot of immoral behavior from people who are in your team or in your party or whatever. And I remember when I graduated, I was standing out on the steps of Austin right out here with my parents and I just sort of said a silent prayer. Going for it, I want to be a person of conviction and I never want to be thought of as an opinionated person. And I didn't understand the difference between an opinion and a conviction until I went through three years here. And that little bit of life wisdom has really stuck with me. Thank you. So, you know, the way I think of, of Harvard and the difference it made for me is it was all about opportunity. Um, I am one of these kids that grew up without much uh, and, frankly, not a lot of expectations in my family about what I would do and, and, and what, I, what I could do. But my world unfolded because of opportunities. Um, like that commuter college that costs $50 a semester. That's how somebody who drops off the path, who gets married at 19, who, who falls down, gets a second chance to get up and get back in and get an education and finish that education and actually go out and do something. And for me, it meant go out and teach special needs kids. And it was extraordinary because teaching those special needs kids was all about prying open a little more opportunity for those kids, just a little more chance for them to be able to do something, for them to be able to live a fuller life, to be able maybe to live independently for some of them. It was a huge difference. And when I couldn't do that anymore, and we just all have to remember, I hope times have changed, but I was visibly pregnant at the end of teaching the kid the first year. And the principal did what I think a lot did in those days. Smile told me I'd done a great job and didn't ask me to come back and teach another year. So I'm at home with a new baby and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And the answer was supposed to be you're supposed to stay home, you're supposed to rock your baby and it's all you're supposed to be really happy about that. And I just I just still wanted to do more. And so Law school, law school was like, I can't tell you how crazy it was for somebody like me. It was like completely off the radar screen. But the point was, once I got hold of the idea, it was the fact that there was some, there was a place nearby. Again, a public university. It cost, <laughs> you'll love this, Harvard Law students, it cost $450 a semester. Um, but that was all about opportunity. So from there, as I said, I practice law for a little bit, I go into teaching, I love the teaching. Because teaching is both halves for me. Teaching is once again about teaching about opportunity. What, what else you can do, you get smarter, your tools get better. You can get out there and do amazing things and the fights that I was starting to get engaged in, the research I was doing. Why, why are so many people in this country going broke? I mean, that was the heart of my research. When I was doing my work, we were on the path toward a million families a year saying, that's it, I'm broke, I'm done, I'm out of this. Saying publicly, I will file a public declaration that I am a failure in that giant American economic game. And here's the deal. These were people who looked a lot like the rest of us. These were people who had grown up, gone to college, gotten married, bought homes, had kids, gotten decent jobs, and then it just took one big one, and they were totally upside down. A bad medical problem, bad diagnosis, a pink slip, somebody gets laid off and it all comes unraveled, or a divorce or death in the family, a family that breaks apart. And that's it, they're all the way down. Why was that happening in America, and why was it happening 
in the 90s, this era of great prosperity, and on into the 2000s. So this was the thing I was working on. And this was where, after I said, I had a great time teaching here my first year. We can talk about lots of things that happened in that first year. I had a wonderful time. I went back to Penn, and Charles Freed got on the phone and said, Liz, which is what he always called me, Liz, you should come back, and you should come here permanently. And I said, Charles, I'm happy at Penn. It's a smaller school. It really works. We still have this great house. So I'll go work out. And Charles said, you will have more opportunities at Harvard to fight your fights and to teach more students. And that was the answer. I came to Harvard and got deeper into the fights. It was a bigger place to be able to do that. And every day, got to walk into the classroom where such privilege, such opportunity, such incredible tools. But to say to people, come on, get better at what you've got and widen it out. Because there's, the only mistake you can make is not to get out there and do something you're passionate about. I loved it. It's true. So I, I, I can't help moving. Uh, uh, That's not exactly the way I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> she was teaching us that lesson by being very hard on us. <laughs> and are you sorry? She was probably the best professor I had. <laughs> can we introduce your golden retriever into this conversation? Oh, we can. So, uh, <laughs> In the spring of the year I visited, um, uh, I was teaching commercial law. I know, you all love it. Uh, yes, I can recite UCC sections from memory, and I'm going to ask Cotton to do that before we three. <laughs> but um, I was teaching uh, Uniform Commercial Code, and we're in the middle of class one day. People are having trouble with the distinction between a bona fide purchaser for value and a good faith purchaser, something I'm sure all of you remember. <laughs> um, and you may remember a bona fide purchaser for value is you're on inquiry notice. So if there's something a little mm, 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 right, you have to know that. And it has all these legal implications that come from it. Talk about using the tools. And the good faith purchaser, just uh, uh, all you have to do is not know that these are bad people who are doing bad things. So we're working through, and we're working problems, and so on. And it's one of those days. Everybody in class tangles it up. They get it six ways to Christmas. And finally, I said, look at it this way. I said, a good faith purchaser is like a golden retriever. Good heart, empty head. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of days later, we're working another problem. And part of the problem turns on, do you know which standard to apply? And I said, and which standard do you apply? And several people in the room barked. <laughs> That's how Harvard students help each other out. <laughs> so, so when it got to be the end of the semester, my class got together and um, bought me a present. A little golden retriever. And what was her name? Good faith. <laughs> it's true. It's true. She's a good dog. Senator Reed. Well, I had a lot to of time to think about well, Harvard Law School because I was one of the oldest people in my class. I was 29. I had relatively short hair, so I went or tried to go to a party. Most people assumed I was an undercover narcotic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have that. wondered about that in the Senate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't particularly me, it was just the circumstances. Uh, and for the record, I, I was actually, Tim and I were classmates. And I might have been one of those old, stodgy people that inspired me to go to missions. I'll take some credit for that. And I met Mark Warner in 1982 in Washington, and he had this bizarre idea of leaving the war and then going to business. Like, what an idiot. <laughs> so I'm an astute financial analyst. In my <laughs> one of the great things I think this law school does is it 
shows people that it's not really about answers. It's about the right question. And I think that serves all of us very well in the United States Senate and the Congress. Because we're confronted with answers every day and, you know, okay, that's a better answer, this is a better answer. Our job is to say, wait a second, are you asking the right question? Is, is this, you know, is this question uh, going to deliver uh, something of value to people? And that to me is what this law school is so superbly gifted with doing to their students. And when you come here, leave here with a questioning mind, uh, and you know, regardless of your political disposition, you're always willing to say, well, let me question my own view. Am I supposed to, how sure I, am I about this, this issue? Uh, you're a much more effective, not only uh, member of Congress, but you're a much more effective citizen. And that's the great gift I think this law school has given me. Let me uh, we're going to go to the audience just just right after this. But if you could ha each answer briefly, as, as, just sitting here listening to your conversation today and enjoying it so much. Here you are, you have five of you from the Senate. You're wonderfully civil. You're respectful. <laughs> you tell stories that entertain each other. I mean, you seem like you would all get along really well. <laughs> And I don't know quite what happens because you're, some of your other colleagues are similar. They're, they're, they're very, some really fine people are in American politics. Some really fine people are in the United States Senate. And yet what the public sees, and maybe it's the press, maybe it's the, the aspect of theater that we have, is, is there's a sense that everybody's each other's throats uh, in, in politics. And how do we, is there a way we can bridge that or make bring the kind of spirit that exists in this conversation more to our national conversation. I, there, there's something that doesn't fit, doesn't add up here. But there's lots of factors. I mean, you can look at technology, social media. You can look at the way we have to run campaigns today. You can look at the, a whole bunch of issues. I'm, you know, I'm probably the longest serving member here, but I had used to sit down in the house with Henry Gonzalez, who was elected in 1960, a wonderful man. And he talked about the fact that you know, we had time to be together. We couldn't go back every weekend to our district. We didn't have to go back every time to our district. So there's, there are a lot of issues that uh, I think are structural. You know, you can talk about you know, Citizens United. You can talk about redistricting, which is a big issue and a very important issue. So the, the dynamic has changed significantly over so many years. There's a generational shift. I mean, uh, when I got there, most of the members, particularly senior members, had been in the armed services. And they had something in common, et cetera. That's less the case now. Uh, but I think we have an obligation not just to be civil in these forms, but to be civil on the floor. And I must give great credit to uh, our chairman, Tom and I's chairman, John McCain. I mean, he established this notion is that we're going to work together. And mm -hmm. with Tom's help, we have really brought the only bill, major bill to the floor with a 89 votes mm -hmm. for it, bipartisan. So it can be done. And in fact, I would argue that when it comes to military policy, it's probably because of the inclination of most of my colleagues more doable than some other more divisive issues. But, but there, we have to work together. It doesn't come automatically. And it comes, in, in my sense, in many respects because of the personality and leadership of one or two or three people. One is, is Senator McCain. Anybody else want to jump in? So I, I'm going to fight the premise of the question, okay. and that is, uh, and I'm going to do it in two ways. The first is to say there actually is a lot of stuff that gets done on a bipartisan basis. Uh, 40 million people in this country have hearing loss, uh, and yet fewer than one in six get hearing aids that they need. Why? Because they cost too much money. Uh, they cost them the thousands of dollars, and why do they cost them the thousands of dollars? Because the hearing aid industry, which is very small and concentrated, basically has captured all the state legislatures and gotten a whole bunch of rules that help protect them and drive the cost up enormously. How can you fix that? You can override it at federal law and simply say that hearing aids can be sold across the counter. And yeah, the FDA needs to look at them, put you know, certain warnings on them, and so on. But the consequence of doing that is you take hearing aids and you take the price from thousands of dollars, literally down to a few hundred dollars. All it takes is a federal law to make it happen, but you're up against an industry that doesn't want it to happen. So I had this idea. 
I called Chuck Grassley and said, Chuck, I got an idea. He said, what? Uh, and I told him about it, and he said, literally, within the space of a few minutes, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm going to ask my staff to check it out. I'm going to look at the details, make sure you're right on this. And if you are, I'm all in. And Johnny Isaacson, a Republican from Georgia, said, me too. I'm in on this. Susan Collins was in on it from Maine. Uh, and we, this is the other part about what happens in Washington. There was already a bill that was moving through that had to pass, and that was the FDA reauthorization that the industry, drug industry, wanted to see it go all the way through, which meant it would pass. So that little train is starting to leave the station, and we could hook a car on the back end, and that was hearing aids. And about a month ago, month, six weeks, Donald Trump actually signed that into law. And in a couple of years, there are going to be millions of people in this country who are going to have access to hearing aids, who didn't before. And let me just say, to anybody who thinks they have hearing aids, this is a huge difference for people who are isolated, for people who can't talk to people in their own family, for people who don't want to drive cars or go to the grocery store because they can't. This is a life-changing difference. It gets no headlines. That's fine. That's not why we do the work. But my point is, we do reach out. And I want to make one other point. And yeah, you're right. There are places where we pound, plant our feet and pound on each other sometimes. And you know what? My view on that is when somebody's trying to take away health care from 25 million Americans, that is a time to plant your feet and start pounding on each other. Sometimes we're friends and sometimes we ain't. Let me, um, I'm going to accept part of your premise and disagree with the other part. So, um, system not working. 230 years ago, Philadelphia, the last month, the framers knew that the, you know, that the, the nation after the Revolution or was over wasn't working. The 13 states, it wasn't hanging together. They wanted to create a national government, but they were very worried. If we create a national government and a president, what we knew at the time were emperors, monarchs, sultans, kings, popes. And so they were worried about an overreaching executive. That's what they worried about. And they created a system to check that possibility. I argue we're living in the very time that they contemplate. And the mechanisms they put in place, look, Article Three judges are doing some pretty good work because they have life tenure. Um, the press is doing some pretty good work. The right of the people to peacefully assemble, petition government for redress of grievances, look at the women's march, look at the airport protests after the Muslim travel ban, look at people reaching out to us in the thousands of town hall meetings in letters and mail. Governors saying, okay, Mr. President, you pull out of the uh, Paris Climate Accord, but we're staying in the power of the states under Article 4. I would argue that the system is actually showing remarkable signs that it is working. Save the Article 1 branch. We do more than you think for the reasons that uh, Elizabeth said. I think the Article 1 branch is broken. I meet people every day who like or don't like President Trump or President Obama. They don't think the presidency is broken. I meet people who like or don't like the Roberts Court. They don't think the judiciary is broken. But I meet people every day, Democrats and Republicans, who think the Article 1 branch is broken for a million reasons, but one of the most important of which we're not, we're not acting like an Article 1 branch. We're acting like an Article 2 and a half branch. We respond to things that presidents do, and that's not what the Article One branch was supposed to do. We, we won't even have a vote on a war authorization. We're at war right now without a vote, and I'm kind of quirkily obsessed with that. So I would say, say a lot of our system is working the way Madison thought it would in 1787, and the piece that is broken and needs serious reform is the Article One branch. I would, I would um, echo what Tim said. I mean, I, I sometimes say I work in the only place in America where being a gang member is a good thing. <laughs> and I'm part of every gang there's men. You know, if there's a bipartisan group, I'll be there. Uh, and I think, you know, there are, there are some systemic problems. There is no super PAC for rational people. <laughs> well, think about it for a minute. We've got an incentive system that drives you to team sports. And I think most of our politics at this point, I, I think, you know, I would echo all, all so much what Tim says. I really worry about Article One. I worry about the Congress. I worry about if we had it to do over again, can in a society that is as information overloaded as, as we are at times still have a checks and balance system 
when, frankly, you know, we see other systems where parliamentary systems, at least if you win, you run the show until you get thrown out. But I think part of that is because, again, I think the state of our political debate is pretty brain dead and caught in the 20th century. And I did, I'm a big believer in our free enterprise and our capitalism system. I don't think modern American capitalism is working for enough people, and I think most of the ideas that are being generated are 20th century solutions. And we're debating issues that were, you know, on most of the issues, the tax reform debate, the healthcare debate, we are re-debating tired solutions that are 20th century things. And we break these down on an old liberal, conservative, left-right continuum when it is much more a world that is being hurtled into the future and is going to be driven by technology, AI, globalization. This is a future past debate. And if we think about, this when I've talked some about, you know, what a new social contract would look like in terms of portable benefits. Tom and I are both very aware. We have different politics, but I think we're both very aware of the power and the underbelly of the information age that countries like Russia and others can exploit to undermine our democracy. Um, but these are areas, if, if we can find where areas that aren't happening in the 20th century, where we can frame some of this argument around future past, um, we might actually breathe some life back into a, an institution that at this point I think is, is reeling. Well, so I, I would agree uh, with the point that Liz Warren made uh, to dispute the premise of the question in part. I, I think I could think of instances in which I've worked with all four of my colleagues here on this panel, on this, that, or the other thing. Uh, like Jack, I'm fortunate to serve on the Armed Services Committee, which is probably the most bipartisan committee that always passes our bill uh, unanimously. Tim is on there as well. Uh, so is Elizabeth this year, too. Um, I serve on the second most, the committee that's probably the second most like that, which is the Intelligence Committee, of which uh, Mark is the vice chair. Uh, we work in secret, so you don't know it that much. But I think, you know, this week we passed the bill 12 to 3. The underlying substance of it, I want to say passed 15 to nothing or 14 to 1. Um, so there's a lot of issues of overlapping concern or the interest among the people we serve back home that has us work together. Now, you know, controversy uh, sells better than does cooperation in the same way that they report the airplanes that don't land, the air, not the airplanes that do land. They don't report, they report the hurricanes that hit landfall and create natural disasters, not the one that turned back out to the sea. That's just inevitable in the way the media operates. Um, I'd also say, too, though, that some of, some of what you see in Washington, some of what you see in particular in the Congress among the people's representatives reflects what's happened in our country among our people in recent decades. It's really a, a, a generations-long phenomenon of, of the political views of our people starting to align more with the demographic and geographic realities of our country. So you know, New England has basically always been the most liberal part of our country. South has always been the most conservative part of our country. For 130 years, 140 years, until just the last 20 years, the Republican Party was strong in New England because it started as the anti-slave party in the 1850s. The Democratic Party was strong in the South because it was the party of secession in the 1860s. That has changed over time. People say, like, what happened to all the Southern Democrats that helped Ronald Reagan enact his agenda? Like, they didn't go anywhere. They just became Republicans. In some cases, they literally didn't go anywhere, like Richard Shelby, the senator from Alabama. He just became a Republican. So in some ways, it's a kind of a natural sorting out. And I raise that not just as an interesting point of political history and the way history 150 years ago still shapes our politics today, but to point out that increasingly in our country, you, you can live and work and worship among people who are really just like yourself. Um, have your same views about politics and about morals, same economic views and so forth. And I would challenge a lot of you who are, are very privileged to be here, um, especially if, if you come from the background, you know, where you went to Horseman in Manhattan, or you went to Harvard Westlake in Los Angeles, and you went to Yale, unfortunately, and then you <laughs> succeeded in getting into Harvard Law School. Um, you could go on to work at a big white shoe firm in Manhattan or Washington, you could go work in the movie industry in LA or the tech industry in Silicon Valley. You could move in these kind of circles your entire life. I, I would challenge you to try to get outside those circles, like Tim Payne did you know, when he went to Honduras or when he went back to Richmond and became a civil rights lawyer. That's happened for me when I was uh, in the <coughs> Army. Um, you know, Calvin Coolidge's son one summer was picking tobacco when he was off college uh, in the Connecticut 
tobacco fields, back when Connecticut still had the tobacco fields. Who did you tobacco? Very hard, very hard work uh, in the summer. And some kid next to him said, college boy, what does your dad do for a living? He said, well, my dad's the president. Kid said, of the United States? Calvin Coolidge's son said, yes. He said, if my dad was president, I don't think I'd be picking tobacco in the summer. And Coolidge's son said, if your dad was my dad, you'd be picking tobacco in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I, I think we, we've lost some of that in our country because, because it is easier to live, especially if you're well-educated, if you're wealthy, if you come from wealth or privilege. It's very easy to stay inside that world your entire life. Some of you are probably in that world and have been for your 20 or 25 years on this earth. I'd encourage you to find, try to find ways, whether it's in the law or outside the law or where you choose to go practice law, to try to find ways outside of that. Excellent. We can continue this conversation for a long time, but I'd like to invite the audience now to, uh, if you have questions, there are two microphones. If you could raise your hand, there are two people down here. That, can we deliver one of the microphones over here while we're waiting for this? If you could just send it down. And where is the first microphone? If you please stand, if you would. Okay. Two people can hear you well. Is this on? Yeah. Um, please raise your right hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm left handed. Um, uh, Tom Cotton, I read your biography on Wikipedia, and you were raised. It must be hundred percent true then. Must be. <laughs> um, uh, you were raised a Methodist. I was raised a Methodist. Um, you went to Harvard College. I went to Harvard College. You went to Harvard Law School. I went to Harvard Law School. You're a sixth generation from your state, and a tenth generation from my state. But I'm descended. I was the president of the Democrats Club. My roommate was the president of the Republicans Club. I don't think that could happen to me. Um, I'm descended from illegal aliens, boat people. 27 of them came on the Mayflower, okay? <laughs> they, were not, they, were not that, they were not liberals. They were Christian fanatics. And I mean that in a good way, because I'm not ashamed of them. But um, you're a patriot. I'm a patriot. My senator, Elizabeth Warren, is a patriot. You guys have to work together. You have to have committee hearings. You have to hear people who know what is the facts, and you have to make your decision. And I ask you and your Republican colleagues, and I'm not saying Democrats are all saints, but you guys have to work together more than you are. That's not a question. <laughs> well, so, so I, and I don't, I don't disagree with that. Again, I, as as Liz said, on the biggest issues, we're just, we have some fundamental disagreements. That's not a bad thing. That's what Congress is supposed to help the country accomplish. That's why you come together in Congress. And I, I think she probably does a pretty good job of representing the majority of people from Massachusetts. Um, I'm not sure I'd get elected from Massachusetts. I'm not sure she would get elected from Arkansas. I try to do a good job representing the views of the majority of the people of Arkansas. But again, that's why we have a Congress to come together in Congress. You know, though, I would say on that, I think this is one of the biggest problems, and that is uh, that a lot of the influence, and none of us talked about this, and what's broken in Congress, is whether or not uh, people in the Senate and people in the House are representing the views of those who are uh, in their home states or home districts, or whether they're representing the views, let's just be blunt, of the banks, of the drug industry, of those who make very large contributions, not just to political campaigns, but who spread money entirely through Washington. Washington is awash in money. So it's the money to campaigns, it's the money to PACs, it's the money to super PACs, it's then the money that goes to the lobbyists, and it's the money that goes to the bought and paid for experts, and the money that goes to the so-called think tanks. It's the money that's there to make sure that the positions of the rich and the powerful are represented in every room, in every decision that takes place in Washington, D.C. And until we deal with the money problem, I don't think it's possible just to hang back and say, oh, the only reason that, I'm going to stay diplomatic here, the only reason that the banks got what they wanted this week was because the people in my home district don't want 
to have an option to be able to sue them when they get cheated. And so um, the way I see this is that our systemic problem is that we don't do enough representing the people because Mark makes the point that sensible people don't have PACs, but real people don't have PACs. Real people don't have the kind of influence in Washington that they should have. And until we fix that problem, there ain't nothing else that's going to get fixed. Can you take the next microphone over and distribute it? Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Another one for Senator Cotton. Sorry not to beat up on you. But uh, so you made an earlier hilarious joke about Ted Cruz, but it did come from the fact that our current president accused his opponent of, his, uh, accused his opponent's father of murdering a former president. Like, I get that politics is where truth goes to die in many cases, but this has been a novel and worrying time. We're supposed to be trying to make policy based on, you know, facts and reasonable determination and it's good for people, but you know, how do we ensure that we do that, uh, you know, while uh, and compete with each other while, while having respect for, you know, the truth? The judge is giving your question a very high mark back there. <laughs> 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 Who's going to uh, So, I, I mean, I, I try to do the same thing now that I tried to do for the four years that President Obama was president. I tried to do what I think is the best interest of the Arkansans who elected me to serve them and the best interest of our country. Um, obviously, a president of my party is going to, I'm going to agree with him more than I did with uh, Barack Obama. But at root, I'm going to support the president when I think he's right. I'm going to try to change his mind, as I have on occasion, when I think he's wrong. And if I can't, I'm going to vote what I think is in the best interest of my state and my country. It's the same way these four feel as well. Uh, you know, there's an old joke, I think it was a, uh, it may have been Tip O'Neill actually, it was once a question, it may have been uh, John Dingell as well, longest serving member of the House from Michigan, said you've served underneath nine, nine presidents. And he immediately cut off the reporter and said, I've served with nine presidents because the president is not your boss when you serve in the Congress. Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer is not your boss when you serve in the Senate. The people who elected you are your boss, and they have a chance to review your performance. And they will in Arkansas, and three years from me, they will this year in Massachusetts, and Virginia for Tim, and for Liz, and that's the way our system's designed. Can I just say, I, this is a really important question. So when I lived in Honduras, it was a military dictatorship, and generals ran it, and they had taken it over, and, and they did all the things that we're seeing. So the, the, in, the individuals were strong, and they wanted to weaken the institutions. And I do believe we're living in an existential moment right now that Madison predicted, because the president attacks the press, he attacks the judiciary, he attacks Congress, he attacks notions of religious freedom, um, he attacks governors that he doesn't agree with, he attacks, you know, basically any institution, attacks diplomacy, willing to get into fights with allies, any institution. Uh, that is out there that was designed as a check, the president uh, is attacking, and that's what happened in Honduras. And frankly, most people in the world live in systems where the individuals at the top are powerful, and any rule can be changed at a whim, and the institutions are weak. I do believe that there is an immune system reaction that is extremely powerful that is showing now, and that the chapter's end is going to be that we are in a country where the institutions are more powerful than any individuals, including a president, including a senator. And if that's the end of the chapter, that's going to be a powerful affirmation of the Madisonian vision, not only for us, but it's going to be an affirmation to people around the world who live in systems who one day want to have institutions that are stronger than the people at the top. We're in an existential moment. It's the stress test of the constitutional democracy. There are, there are a lot of signs that we will be successful in this, but that's, that's only if everybody. Okay, I'm only getting a five for my answer. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 please. Can I just say one thing very quickly? Uh, Elizabeth is exactly right in terms of the deluge of money and the question of who you're voting for the special interest or the people. And I think she's right about too often it's, it's not the people. But when the people are informed and 
engaged and aroused, they are the ultimate voice. That's the strength of our democracy. We saw that, in my view, in the healthcare debate. You know, we didn't have to get a thousand people coming out to a <coughs> town hall meeting to say, don't do this. And ultimately, that was probably, over all the interest groups and everything else, that was the dispositive factor. So we have an obligation not only to try to change the rules in a positive way to make sure the voice of the people is heard, but actually listen to people and ensure they're involved in this process. Yeah. But voice of the people means they also all get to vote. Oh, yeah, no, I think that's, that's the real voice. I, we're going to try to get in a couple more questions, maybe three. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator Cotton, this is the third consecutive question for you. Um, Whoa. I am one of your constituents, Rob Leffler from Fayetteville. You mentioned your uh, extraordinary older sister, Sarah. I taught her torts. And, uh, <laughs> she was a better student than I was as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had dinner with your uh, formidable mother. Um, so I teach health law. And I'd like to follow on with one of uh, Senator Warren's questions by asking about uh, Tom Cotton and the Affordable Care Act. Now, you're thoroughly familiar, although I have never seen you say it in public, fact that the Affordable Care Act, as implemented on a bipartisan basis in Arkansas, has brought insurance to well more than, well, well, well more than 2,000, 200,000 people who never had it before, and has brought an enormous flow of federal funds into the state, a full state, and has kept many a rural hospital from having to close. We've been leading the nation in many respects in terms of adding insurance to poor people. And still what we have continually heard from our congressional delegation is really nothing more than repeal and replace. What I'd like to ask you is, you've got a national reputation. Why don't you stand out from among your lockstep Republican colleagues and level with the people of Arkansas and the people of this nation, and tell them like it is, tell them like it is, that the Affordable Care Act has brought tremendous benefits to our state. Well, Professor Leffler, I don't dispute that some people have benefited from it. What I would say, though, is that many people have been hurt by it as well. 50,000 Arkansans who make less than the median income have to pay a fine because Obamacare made their insurance unaffordable. It'd be a lot more than that that would lose their, or that would not have insurance if the IRS didn't fine them for that fact. I get letters all the time about people who see their insurance premiums going up. It's beginning to start again because of open enrollment season. Uh, the governor, as you know, has, has submitted a new waiver to the Department of Health and Human Services specifically to try to address some of the problems with our Medicaid expansion, especially the cost of it. Since right now we're only paying 5% of the cost. We're just going to double over the next three years. We don't have a lot of money laying around the cushions in our state government in Arkansas. So, I don't know many people who don't want to provide affordable, quality, and well-tailored insurance to our Americans. I'm focused on doing that for Arkansans. I think we can do that in a way that better serves the interests of all Arkansans at a lower price and give them more flexibility and more choice. That's the bottom let me, line. Let me just add here something. There's some very important good things in the Affordable Care Act. There are also a lot of mistakes that are made in the Affordable Care Act. And where I worry back to Tim's comments about Article I powers in the Congress, if we think back, you know, two of the most popular programs in our country, Medicare and Social Security. Truth is, Congress got neither one of those right the first time. The expectation that when you're doing major policy, you're ever going to get anything 100% right the first time has never been true in our nation. But what has happened in the past has been we directionally had a direction, and then you come back and fix and keep what's good and fix what's wrong. I can give you 20 different things I'd love to change in the Affordable Care. I'd love to move, actually move the cost containment rather than just coverage. But it's I, one of the things I, that I worry about that, that in terms of our institutional challenges, unless we get out of this mindset that, you know, some of us believe that the words were brought down with Moses on the tablets, and others believe, you know, it's repeal and replace for seven years and they got no plan. We've got to get out of that mindset. You know, I've been a, I was a venture capitalist for, for 20 years. I've never invested in a company that ever met its business plan. 
The people who are successful are the ones that were able to adjust to markets and conditions they move along. And what I fear that is plaguing our political system at this point is that we've become so entrenched on talking points, and I would argue talking points on 20th century ideas, that we can't get out of those talking points and agree where there is some commonality and keep what's good and fix what's wrong. And until we can sever that, and healthcare could be the place, uh, we're going to have a repeat because you're going to have no certainty. Because, you know, if there's not some bipartisan buy-in on major policy changes, things are going to linger in limbo forever. Because you're not going to have either party get a 100% solution. Just quickly, uh, we have a uh, test of this hypothesis of whether we can do anything in the Alexander Murray legislation, bipartisan, by two eminent members of the Senate that would restore the course subsidies uh, that would lower the rates for all of them our, uh, pro at least the private market, and uh, we hope we can get that done. Uh, and that will take uh, uh, votes on both sides of the aisle and the president's support. Lawrence, can you bring, there's a microphone here, and there, bring one down in here too. I'd, I'd love to get more women to ask questions if you could. Some women to ask questions. I, I, I won't do a transgender remark now, please. <laughs> uh, I'm the class of 1957, and I'm one of the rare breeds of graduates who practice with labor law. And I've been doing it for over 50 years, negotiating hundreds of union contracts. I think I understand the art of making a deal. And this is a question, and this is a question for the entire panel. I have a couple of rules, all right, and these have been said before. And you're at the table and you're dealing with your union adversaries and they're representing workers, and you're representing management, you have diverse interests. But the first rule is you listen. And listening doesn't mean to stop talking. Listening means to hear what they have to say and put yourself in their position and see whether they're telling you something that's honest and needs to be addressed. If you don't listen, that way, you will never make a deal. Second rule, you do not mock, ridicule, insult the other side, because that changes the negotiation from substance to personality. And then you've lost the art of the deal. That's the reality. I've been through it all. Now, I say that to each and every one of you. You need to follow those rules. If you want to serve the interests of the public and the people for whom you're elected, you have to stop talking over other people. You have to stop mocking, ridiculing, insulting on television to reporters and end it. End it and sit there and do what you're elected to do. And that's the way you make deals. Believe me, I have a lot of experience in it. If you don't learn these lessons, it hasn't been learned, and you will continue down this path of division, hostility, and this country will not be made America, make America great again. Making America great again is not only jobs, but it's treating, teach, treating people with dignity and respect. Thank you. Thank you. So, Senator, yes, this is the last question. Thank Senator you. Senator Al Franken has published a book since the last election entitled Giant of the Senate. Um, I don't know if any of you have read it, but I wonder if any of you cares to comment on the picture of the Senate as it stands today that he presents in that book. We're not that funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A really good book, and when he says he's Ted Cruz's best friend, and he hates Ted Cruz, <laughs> I think that Al captures a certain. Uh, <laughs> uh, a certain truthiness. Uh, uh, that, that no, but I'm serious. I think Al's book is a great book, so I hope everybody buys it, I hope everybody reads it, because it's, it's funny, 
and it's intended to be funny. But it's funny with a lot of barbs in it, and that's the only point of, of telling that memorable line, which actually is repeated multiple times in the book. Uh, but it's a good book. Um, uh, he's good. I'm going to do the same thing I did in my college and postgraduate career, wait for the cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any final thoughts here? Final thoughts, Tom? You've had, you've had the floor. You've got a final thought. Benediction? It's a uh, real pleasure to be back on campus with everyone and to hear uh, very good advice from many of you, especially some of my elders. Uh, I get that in the Senate as well. But uh, the, the, some of the advice you've had, had here today for all of us, not just as politicians, but I think for everyone, especially some of you youngsters as you're starting out in your career, is pretty good life lessons to try to, try to uphold. Uh, you always fail in life. We're all flawed. Uh, but you can always work harder to be your better self. So thank you all for welcoming back. Thank you. As, as much as you want to show it, throw a shoe at the TV when the news comes on. We all feel the same way and we're inside the TV. <laughs> but don't tune out. Don't tune out. If you tune out, you turn the keys over to the extremes because they're not going to tune out. And you've got to make it safe for good people. Of, echo what the gentleman here was class of 57 said. You've got to make it safe for good people of different political views to actually still work together and recognize there's never going to be that perfect policy. And there's never going to be and one party doesn't have a monopoly on truth or patriotism or virtue. And the genius of our country has always been that notion that at the end of the day, there was no challenge you couldn't take on. And that, but it was, it was this notion that you had to do it together. And some of that is at risk. And if you turn off the TV and throw that shoe, it's going to get, get at greater risk. So my, my advice is to the students and only the students you, you do not know, you, and you'll come to appreciate this, but you do not know what a privilege it is to work in a field where you can, within your workday, help people at the most vulnerable and challenging moments of their lives. A lot of people don't have jobs where they get to do that. They might do it on the weekends, they might do it in the evening, but you get to do it in the workday. You don't have to do it for your entire workday. There's all kinds of ways you can do it. But the skills that you are getting here will enable you to help people at the most desperate and vulnerable moments in their lives. And it's an incredible privilege and also a burden and a responsibility, but a very worthy one to have that opportunity. So to those whom much is given, much is expected. So mine goes back to right where I started, and that is it's about opportunity. And that's why I don't limit mine just to the students. I didn't come to Harvard. I, I was sitting here trying to do the math quickly. I was really, I think I was 40 when I came to Harvard. And I was 60 when I went to Washington, or plus. Um, the point is, the opportunities are all out there. The opportunity to do some good. The opportunity to find that thing in you that really makes you get up early in the morning and keeps you up late in, at night. And that you all have the tools. Just get out there and do it. Because we got a world right now that needs a whole lot of help. And we've got a country that needs a whole lot of help. Um, you can be part of that. You can be part of making it all better. So thank you. Let me make two points. Uh, we are in extraordinary challenging times. Uh, we see dysfunction. We see threats uh, to our environment, to our national security, to the opportunity. My colleagues have talked about some of the things we don't really focus in and we should. What's the impact of our artificial intelligence, et cetera? Uh, we should take some comfort in the fact that uh, our predecessors, our ancestors have also endured difficult times. And somehow, not very elegantly, uh, not very uh, sedately, but rather boisterously, we somehow, through this uh, constitutional framework, endured and prospered. And we'll do it again, but it won't be easy. And it'll take us all to commit ourselves to that effort. And in a similar vein, my second point is that we are all the beneficiaries of the sacrifice and service of so many different people. And not just those who wear the uniform of the United States, but 
so much we owe them. But our, the people that helped us, the teachers that guided us. So when we want to sort of sit back and relax and just uh, rev up the Ferrari and go for a spin, uh, stop and think maybe something you can do as a citizen for your community. Maybe it's not grandiose, but it's so critical, and that's the key to this country. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Five, for renewing our faith in the Institute. And thank you for refreshing our belief in civility.